This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. You would think after uh, all these months of putting on and taking off masks that I'd be better at it by now, but it's still, still things catch us up. You would think that after thousands and thousands of years, we would be kinder and more loving to one another, and yet still uh, from time to time and often in our world, there is madness. In this time of Lent, we examine our hearts, we reflect on uh, who God has made us to be, we reflect on who God has called us to be, we think about the ways that God's love is present in the world now, and we think about God's eternal plan of salvation, the tomorrow, or mañana in Spanish, uh, which you'll hear more about uh, later on in the service. We're glad that you are here worshiping with us from wherever you are. Uh, we're glad that you're able to tune in. We rejoice that we can be uh, the people of God together, perhaps separated by distance, but by the power of the Holy Spirit, united in heart and faith, uh, united not just with our own Long Memorial congregation, but with churches throughout the world who are worshiping God on this day. <clears throat> Uh, you may have seen, if you are a resident of Person County, that the risk level indicator was moved down from red, the highest level of risk, down to yellow, which is the lower uh, level of risk. And our administrative council uh, back in December uh, said, decided that when that, that when that risk level came down, that we would meet again and determine how we could safely come back uh, worshiping in person. So now that that uh, has happened within our uh, county, uh, we look forward to gathering together. I believe we're going to try to get together on Tuesday night, uh, Tuesday evening this week, <clears throat> to have a meeting with interested persons uh, who are uh, feeling called and led to help us as a whole church organize our uh, uh, our way of coming back together in a safe manner. Uh, speaking of coming back together, it's good for me to be back. I appreciate Colby and all the others who led worship last week, gave me a Sunday off, and uh, uh, was uh, a, an important time, ended up being an important time to recuperate from uh, not feeling well. Uh, and so I praise God for health and uh, uh, to be with you again uh, we want to also remind folks uh, that uh, your faithfulness in giving and supporting the work of this church is important and vital for us. And, and so if you pray and, and uh, God leads you to want to be generous with that which God has first given you uh, in your tithes and offerings, a portion of that which God has first given, we pray that you'll be faithful in giving that uh, to the church and other causes that are important as we share the abundance of God's creation with one another. So uh, you can, you can uh, do that online. You can mail in a check to the church. Uh, a lot of information on our website about how you can support uh, the church financially, and we are grateful for it. Uh, we thank uh, Hogan and Hunt back there, our, our tech team, for uh, bringing this to you. And uh, also grateful uh, for uh, Chuck Higgins, our music director, and Jana uh, Kistner, who's our uh, accompanist. We thank you for your leadership in music today. Also out on our website, uh, Pam Day, our director of children's and youth ministries and our preschool director, has a wonderful children's lesson. And so if there's a, a small person in your uh, sphere of influence that would be blessed by a scripture lesson and a children's message, I invite you to look at that uh, as well. Um, again, this is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. We have for our prelude this morning, uh, Jen, is it the same one from the first service? Uh, I wanted to share with you these uh, lyrics. Jesus, joy of our desiring, holy wisdom, love most bright. Drawn by thee, our souls aspiring, soar to uncreated light. Word of God, our flesh that fashioned with the fire of life impassioned, striving still to truth unknown, soaring and dying round thy throne. We worship God today.
Call to worship and our call to worship and opening prayer this morning are both by Levon Baylor. And the call to worship reads, The days are surely coming, says our God. The day is here to affirm a new covenant. We call on God's steadfast love and mercy. We seek a strong and vital relationship with our God. God's law will be written on our hearts. Our Creator claims us and forgives our faithlessness. We are eager to know the God who loves us. We are ready to learn God's intention for us. God offers us the joy of salvation. Our brokenness can be healed and our wholeness restored. We are open to the new and right spirit that God offers. We seek guidance together for our daily living. Let's pray. As Jesus offered up prayers and supplications to you, O oh God, we cry out to you today. You know our losses and our fears. You understand our pain and our suffering. We wish to see Jesus, to know the healing touch felt by so many. We want to hear a reassuring voice. We long to see a new day when evil is overcome and wrong cannot prevail. Lift us up and draw us to yourself as we worship in this hour. Equip us for our daily living as we seek to be true to your covenant with us. Amen. Our opening hymn this morning is Spirit, Open My Heart. Thank you. 
continue to worship with our statement of faith, and I invite you to um, declare these words with me. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Our scripture reading this morning comes from uh, the prophet Jeremiah, chapter 31, verses 31 through 34. It reads, The time is coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the people of Israel and Judah. It won't be like the covenant I made with their ancestors when I took them by the hand to lead them out of the land of Egypt. They broke that covenant with me, even though I was their husband, declared the Lord. No, this is the covenant that I will make with the people of Israel after that time, declares the Lord. I will put my instructions within them and engrave them on their hearts. I will be their God and they will be my people. They will no longer need to teach each other to say, Know the Lord, because they will all know me. From the least of them to the greatest, declares the Lord. For I will forgive their wrongdoing and never again remember their sins. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. Our anthem this morning is titled, more Love to Thee, performed by our Long Memorial Handbell Ensemble.
I'd like to begin this morning uh, telling a story uh, of the great stories many of you know of C.S. Lewis and his uh, set of books, The Chronicles of Narnia, which are childhood favorites, uh, beloved around the English-speaking world. Uh, and this story comes not from the most famous book, The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe, but this is uh, from the book Prince Caspian, one of the others in uh, the set. And uh, I'm, I'm uh, indebted to a, someone who I don't know, but found on the internet, uh, Colin Beaven, who wrote in 2015, kind of uh, reprised the story a little bit and shared it uh, for any to read. But um, so we have Prince Caspian, the hero, and he is uh, having to fight the evil usurper King Miraz. Prince Caspian is the rightful king, but the uh, King Miraz has stolen the throne, and so there's a battle. And uh, Peter and Susan and Edmund and Lucy are in uh, the world of Narnia again, helping Prince Caspian. And uh, they have to travel across Narnia together, uh, along with a dwarf named Trumpkin to join forces with Caspian. And at one point, they decide that climbing down into a gorge uh, to be near a river and to go that way is the quickest way to get to the river. And uh, so as they are starting to head down, Lucy sees the mystical lion Aslan, the, the favorite of all of that series, the Chronicles of Narnia. And Aslan is directing her and, uh, and the rest of them to go up, out of the gorge, a different way. But she tries to explain this to the other children, and they don't listen to her. They can't see Aslan. Uh, only she can see him and loves him uh, with their special bond that they have. Uh, and so she is talked out of the trip of following Aslan, and they all descend into the gorge where King Miraz's archers have laid a trap for the traveling band. And uh, they unleash their arrows and they have to flee for their lives, running back up out of the gorge. Now, uh, they make it, thank goodness, I don't think that's a spoiler for the whole book, but they make it up out of the gorge and they're exhausted and they fall asleep. When uh, Lucy, uh, she hears this voice, the voice that she loves is calling her name, feeling like the voice she liked best in the world has been calling her name. And that voice wakes her up, and it is indeed Aslan. And they have this uh, conversation after she throws herself into the lion's mane with the joy of seeing him again. And then she proceeds to blame the other children for not listening to her about following the path upwards. But Aslan growls at her. I didn't mean to start slanging the other, she says, but it wasn't my fault anyway, was it? The lion looks straight into her eyes. Oh, Aslan, said Lucy, you don't mean it was me? How could I? I couldn't have left the others and come up to you alone. How could I? Oh, don't look at me that way. Oh, well, I suppose I could have. Yes, and it wouldn't have been alone, I know, not if I was with you. But what would have been the good? Aslan said nothing. You mean, said Lucy rather faintly, that it would have turned out all right somehow? But how, please, Aslan, please tell me. You want me to tell you what would have happened, child, said Aslan? No, no one is ever told that. Oh dear, says Lucy. But anyone can find out what will happen, said Aslan, if you go back to the others now and wake them up from their sleep and tell them you have seen me again and that you must all get up at once and follow me. What will happen? There is only one way of finding out. Do you mean that is what you want me to do? gasped Lucy. Yes, little one, said Aslan. Will the others see you too? asked Lucy. Certainly not at first, said Aslan. Later on, it depends. But they won't believe me, said Lucy. It doesn't matter, 
says Aslan. We'll end the story right there. We know, don't we, that C.S. Lewis, the great Christian apologist of the 20th century, wrote in the words of teenagers and children and lions and witches, not a fanciful fantasy, but as an allegory, the great truth of the gospel and the journey of faith embodied in the story of Aslan and those children. Aslan, the great lion, the wisdom of God, the Savior, the King of the kingdom, the children and the creatures representing various facets of our own mortal, loving, often failing and miserable lives. And we know that it probably is going to turn out well for Aslan and the children in those books. We know too in our scriptures, if you remember what Colby read, how it turns out for the people of Judah, for God's chosen people, the Hebrew children, whose lives and legacy have been permanently altered and torn apart by their being conquered, many of their people killed in defense of their beloved Jerusalem and nation, and many survivors forced to march into exile at the hands of the Babylonians. Jeremiah was left behind and was caught up with a remnant of those left behind in Jerusalem after their neighbors and friends were carried off into exile. And that remnant fled to Egypt to escape the destruction and took Jeremiah against his will. Indeed, Egypt is where Jeremiah died, a stranger in a strange land. But Jeremiah's prophetic message in the lead up to exile as the massive powers of the world inched closer and closer to Jerusalem was for God's people to turn from their sinful ways, Jeremiah said, back to the righteous relationship with the trust of God. Jeremiah would also speak against the kings and leaders of Judah, and that was not a popular message, and he was imprisoned and found guilty, accused of treason. He continued to share God's righteous message, though, regardless of the willingness of the people to hear it. And Lucy said in the Chronicles of Nazareth, uh, uh, Narnia, but they won't believe me, will they? And Aslan said, it doesn't matter. And Jeremiah said, the people won't listen. And God said, it doesn't, it doesn't matter. Jeremiah discerned that the people had put their trust in the temple, a creation of humans. They thought, we've got our temple, we've got our church, everything will always be okay. Perhaps that was originally with good intentions, but over time they were worshiping the creation the, the walls, the space, and not the Creator. And Jeremiah prophesied that a change of heart was necessary, a repenting from that religiosity, and a return to a relationship with the Creator. But the people, alas, didn't heed the warnings, nor did they heed the other signs and words of God, and they bore the wrath of the nations. They traveled, as it were, despite Lucy's warning, down into the gorge, into the waiting trap. But God was not finished with God's plan of salvation and redemption, which brings us to our scripture today. Before where Colby picked it up, uh, uh, in verse 31, in verse 2 of chapter 31, it says, This is what the Lord says, The people who survive the sword will find favor in the wilderness. I will come to give rest to Israel. And then later on in the chapter, it goes on, uh, When I will make a new covenant, uh, the days are coming. When I will make a new covenant with the people of Israel and the people of Judah, after that time, I will put my law in their minds and write it on their hearts. I will be their God and they will be my people. Thus saith the Lord. This Lenten journey that we are on in the present day, not in the book of C.S. Lewis, not in the Old Testament book of Jeremiah, but today, 
This Lenten journey that we are on is not like any others that we have lived through. There are no Lenten lunches every Wednesday with the four other churches who gather each year. We haven't heard inspiring devotions from Dr. Dupree Sanders or Kenneth Stokes. There haven't been any beautiful midday anthems in our fellowship hall in the simple setting of a meal among fellow Christians. And yet, something new has happened. We've received a gift this year that has been rather extraordinary. We've been gifted with insights into the Christian hearts and minds of folks like Hunt Fitzgerald and Hogan Carrier and Ben Tillett and Mackenzie Clayton and Cheryl Allen and Chris Atkins and so many more. Even Anne wrote a piece, Anne Anonymous, that is. They didn't laugh at the early service either at that joke. They have been beautiful and moving. Some of the pieces have reminded us of the times before the pandemic. More than anything, I think uh, I have taken away the steady faith of the writers that even though circumstances have changed over this past year, even though we are unsure what the future holds or looks like, even in the midst of sorrows from isolation or disease, God's love and faithfulness endures forever. It seems to me like God's covenant has begun to come to pass. No longer, Jeremiah said, will they teach their neighbor to say to one another, Know the Lord, because they will all know me. From the least of them to the greatest, declares the Lord. But how can we say this? The pandemic, while case numbers are improving, it rages on. We have ideas and plans about returning to start to fill this sanctuary again, but we aren't sure, to be honest, if they'll come to fruition. What will tomorrow hold? We don't know exactly the circumstance, but we hold fast to God's promise and we tell others about God's promises, even if, like Lucy in Prince Caspian, we are unsure if anyone will listen. It doesn't matter if they listen, says Aslan. You must do your part. It strikes me that this covenant of God prophesied in the book of Jeremiah is about tomorrow, about a time that has perhaps not fully come. Tomorrow. In Spanish, you might know what the word tomorrow is. Mañana. We should know a little Spanish. Knowing that mañana means tomorrow is good for us, uh, I think. Not just because many of our neighbors speak Spanish and knowing the language of our neighbors and guests is a loving act of hospitality, but also perhaps because, and here's a little trivia for you, more Christians in the world speak Spanish than any other language, including English. In fact, according to the statistics I looked up, there are 160 million more Spanish-speaking Christians in the world than there are English-speaking Christians. Well, that's a lot, 160 million. So when we get to heaven, the celestial radio might be playing praise songs in Spanish. Well, we might as well get a jump on understanding so we can sing along mañana, tomorrow. Anyway, uh, I mention about manana because our intern, Colby, uh, shared with me a chapter from a book this week by a theologian named Justo Gonzalez. The word for tomorrow is manana, and he says that Christians, and specifically Latin American Christians, are a tomorrow people, a manana people. You know, when we look around at the world, we watch the news reports, we see even sometimes what goes on in our very own community, we don't see the kingdom fully realized in our world. We cry tears of separation because of death. We are hurt by one another. We even sometimes do hurtful things to those we shouldn't uh, do those hurtful things to. We don't share like we are called to share. We still need to repent. We still need to seek forgiveness. But we believe that tomorrow will come. The ultimate tomorrow that is prophesied in the book of Revelation and is prophesied in the book of Jeremiah. 
the ultimate tomorrow, the ultimate manana, when everyone has enough, where there are no more tears, where love is the basis for every relationship, where justice rolls down like waters and righteousness like a never-failing stream. We believe that that tomorrow is coming. And so we Christians practice for tomorrow. We live into tomorrow as if it were today. Dr. Gonzalez writes in his book uh, being, uh, that, that being spiritual, living into this covenant, means, <clears throat> quote now, I'm quoting now, living out of the future we have been promised precisely because that promise has been sealed and guaranteed by the Holy Spirit. It is life lived out of an expectation, out of a hope and a goal. And that goal is the coming reign of God. To have the Spirit is to have a foot up on the stirrup of the end times future and to live now as those who expect a new reality, the coming of the reign of God. And then Dr. Gonzalez goes on to give an example to illustrate the implications of such future-oriented living and witness. To live as if tomorrow is becoming today, is beginning today. He says this as his example. If I say that I hope someday to move to Japan and to spend the rest of my days in Japan, for I am convinced that no culture is as enlightened, no art is as beautiful, no literature as meaningful as that of Japan, the depth of my conviction will be judged by my present actions. If I am thoroughly convinced that what I say is true, I'll begin studying Japanese. But if, on the other hand, I start building a dream house in which to retire in Georgia, outside of Atlanta, and devote my time to studying Italian, all my enthusiastic declarations about my devotion to Japanese culture will sound hollow. If I truly believe what I say about moving and retiring and spending my days in Japan, I will certainly begin practicing Japanese and I'll begin looking at my present day life under a new light. Well, the same is true, Dr. Gonzalez states, of the expectations of the reign of God. So long as we proclaim the reign of God, but make little effort to speak even a few words of rainies, our witness will hardly be credible. But if by the power of the Spirit we are a pilgrim people liking forward to the coming reign of God, we had better begin practicing the love of that reign. We had better begin organizing our lives according to the new order that we know is coming and that we proclaim. If we believe that God is one day going to write God's promise on our hearts, then perhaps we can start living that manana, that tomorrow, into today. This morning we have heard from Jeremiah about tomorrow, when God will be our God and we will be God's people. When God's promise will be fulfilled and a relationship with God is so written on our hearts that we won't need to tell anyone about it, they'll already know. But until then... Until that tomorrow, we start practicing, not necessarily Japanese, although that would be cool and wonderful and beautiful, but our tomorrow is, our reign of God is. We start learning and practicing what it would be like to act fully like this tomorrow has already come. Because when we get there, how great would it be to already speak the language of God's grace and love and live according to that divine relationship by the power of God. And along the way, we won't keep the secret to ourselves, but we will tell others. They might not yet recognize it like the other children didn't realize what Lucy was saying was true, but like Aslan says, tell them anyway, even if it doesn't matter. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.
Our nation is aware as we come to our time of prayer of brokenness and discrimination, hate, even murder. So we stand uh, with our Asian American and Asian brothers and sisters. We pray that this sanctuary, that this church, that our fellowship would be a safe place for all and that God's justice would be done in the world. We pray also for those who are grieving in our midst. Especially we pray for Ralph Lewis, his children David and Melinda, his grandchildren Isabel and Claire. We pray that they would be comforting, comforted. Uh, yesterday we laid Anne's body to rest and it was a, a wonderful going home service filled with music and memory and faith and love. We pray also for Helen Starr, who's had a rough couple of weeks with health uh, problems uh, back and forth to the hospital and to get various tests done. We pray for Ronnie King and for Barbara, for Jesse Saunders, for Fran Westmoreland and for John Westmoreland. For Mary Calhoun as she recovers from both her stroke and her broken foot. For Rachel Blanchard and Stump Brand. For Janice Wilson and Lois Winstead. For Roland Crawley, Betsy Warren, Barbara Winstead, and Peggy Wade. And I want to offer prayers of thanksgiving for someone in my family. My cousin David and his wife Ashley delivered their first baby this last week, but there were complications and very scary complications at that. But we praise God for the wonderful team at George Washington Hospital up outside of D.C. where they were able to resuscitate little Bo uh, in his first minutes of life, and it looks like uh, things are going to be just fine now. So we praise God for, uh, for that good news <clears throat> in our family's midst. We continue to pray for David and Ashley and little Bo. I would invite now uh, Colby to come forward and offer a pastoral prayer. Will you pray with me? Gracious God, we come to you broken from that which confines us the prejudice buried, weighted down with fear, distorted self-protection, breaking us, breaking you. And so we come to you today seeking to be made whole. For you, God, you put your love within us. You wrote it on our hearts that we may be your people. On this day, we pray for those who weep, we pray for those who are struggling from lack of clean water, from healthy food, quality health care. And Lord, we especially lift up our Asian American siblings who are hurting right now. We grieve with the families and friends of those who were killed earlier this week in Georgia and all those who are a part of the Asian or Asian American communities who have been discriminated against during these COVID times, but even before them as well. We lament our brokenness and our complicity and our own unconscious biases that corrupt our hearts and do harm to people who are created in your beautiful image. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for an end to white supremacy, to injustice, and to violence. We pray that our hearts and our ears would be opened, that we might be the transformation in the world that you call us to be, the new creation bursting forth in the midst of the old. We pray that we might be your manana people. And so we come to you today seeking to be made whole for you, God, put your love within us. You wrote it on our hearts that we may be your people. 
compassionate God, God of covenant, God of love, we come to you tired, yearning for peace and for harmony. Loving God, we offer up our suffering and come to you seeking to be made whole. For you, God, yes, you put your love within us. You write it on our hearts. You wrote that we may be your people. Gentle God, God of covenant, God of love, glorify us through your love. Draw us to you, into you. Anoint us with your presence and your peace. Write your compassion in our hearts that we may love as you love. We ask all of this in Jesus' name the one who taught us to pray together in this way. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil, for thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Thank you, Colby. We give thanks to God as we would at this time in the service uh, for the generosity of the congregation and our friends who allow us and enable us to do the good work of ministry in music and teaching, in uh, a witness to the world that God dissolves, desires for all to have enough. In Jesus' name, we pray a blessing on that generosity. And now we have the hymn that will send us forth from this place, which <clears throat> is, Here I Am, Lord.
I share with you a benediction from the book of 1 Thessalonians, the fifth chapter. Be at peace among yourselves. We urge you, beloved, to admonish the idlers, encourage the faint-hearted, help the weak, be patient with all of them. See that none of you repays evil for evil, but always seek to do good to one another and to all. Rejoice always, pray without ceasing, give thanks in all circumstances, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. Do not quench the spirit, do not despise the words of prophets, but test everything, holding fast to what is good and abstaining from every form of evil. May the God of peace himself sanctify you entirely, and may your spirit and soul and body be kept sound and blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. The one who calls you is faithful, and he will do this. Beloved, pray for us. Go in peace. Thank you.